Hello, everybody, and welcome to the RV Repair Club, our live event for September. Sorry, we're a couple minutes late. I was ranting and raving with Angela and Katie here about my Gen Air refrigerator that they refused to cover under warranty. So we had that happen all the time with RVs. Um, it's been an interesting week. We've done a couple live events um, through some uh, other media stuff, and we've gotten a lot of questions. I see we got 54 people online today, but only one question so far from Teresa. So I'm really going to answer this one really good because it's going to last an hour. So warm up out there and ask some questions. Uh, before I get to Teresa's, one of the things I do uh, want to tell you about that we had an interesting uh, situation happen. I have a friend that has an uh, Icon Renegade, which is a very expensive um, RV motor coach, uh, Super C. And one of the jacks did not retract when he went to move it and it bent the jack and we could not get it to move. Um, it would not come back up because it was bent. So all, the three other ones did. So I called down to HWH to try to get some technical assistance on how we can unbolt it. It's actually, uh, the bracket is welded to the frame and then there's two bolts that go through it on the top and it's really, really hard to get to. And we didn't want to go to that. So we thought, well, let's just cut it off. And I said, you know, before we start doing something like that, I need to get a hold of HWH and uh, they are very busy, I'll grant them that. And some of their techs are out at the um, open house in Elkhart this week. But I said, you know, before we start cutting that off, I wanna make sure there's no hydraulic lines in that cylinder. So it's just a straight action jack that comes down. Uh, it's HWH with the big pad, but it does not have springs on the side. So to bring it back up, hydraulic fluid somehow has to come back in and push that piston or that rod back up into the cylinder uh, we were pretty sure it was it was solid, but I said, before you start doing anything like that, you have to verify that there's no hydraulic lines in there. Well, uh, my friend got impatient. We didn't get back anything back from HWH yet. So last night they uh, started to cut that off because they, they were positive that uh, it was it was solid uh, metal in that frame. And as soon as they pinholed through that uh, and, and got into the center, there was hydraulic fluid that started spraying out and the fire shot out of it. And uh, they uh, called this morning and said, well, I guess you're right. Uh, I said, so the, the key of that thing or the moral of that story is always verify with customer service because now we can't use the slide rooms because they are the same hydraulic system. He's got an open hydraulic line basically in that unit. So. Um, luckily, we, uh, I, I advised them to make sure the slide rooms were in and everything was up that could be up before you did it, just in case. Um, and uh, so you always, you always need to verify. One of the things, you know, I, I have no idea how they routed those in there. I would imagine they've got some kind of a, a small little um, raceway in the metal somehow. And, uh, but, uh, you know, you, I, I've learned to never say never in the RV world. So with that, I am going to look at Teresa has a 2021 Renegade Villaggio. And she said that the water doesn't stay in the toilet bowl. It just runs into the tank, leaving the bowl dry. Tried replacing the rubber ring, did not help what to do. So you either have, um, you know, probably a, an Aquacam or Sealan. Um, uh, if it's a there's two different styles. There's, there's a literally a, a bowl or um, that we call it. It's kind of a round um, flange that when you push up and down, it, it, it rotates a little bit and you'll have a seal all the way around that, that it's supposed to go up and, and it's to hook into. The other one has a little more of a spade type uh, pull out of it. Um, and I'm not sure which one, but I would imagine since you got a renegade, you probably have the, uh, porcelain sea land type one and two things could be an issue number one that flange could have gotten out of uh, round um, developed a little spot uh, you know a soft a flat spot or even a little gouge uh, in it as well or there's a spring that's supposed to bring that back and hold it so when you push the um, pedal down that pulls it back and then when you let it go there's a spring that's supposed to push those back in. And uh, I know I know almost every toilet manufacturer out there has some really good service manuals. So I would recommend uh, just doing a, 
a search for whatever brand, if it's a Sealand, Aquacam, Dometic, um, and just see if you can get your model number and get that exploded view. And you're probably gonna have to take the base out of that unit to be able to get to those springs because the pedest the the actual foot feed or pedestal I call it um, is goes into the shroud area. So look at look at that first. Make sure it's going back in. Uh, if you put a new seal in, then you know normally if it if you didn't do that, I would say put a little uh, Vaseline around the seal and just see if you can get it pliable because a lot of times those will dry up. Uh, you know, pretty well, but since you did put a new seal in, um, that probably is not what it is, but check those other two and see what happens. So we have Joseph has a uh, 1922, 1922. He's got a really old unit. He's got a 2022 uh, Winnebago 2108 SD. What do you do if your slide out works sometimes, but not others? Uh, dealers can't find the problem. Hence, I am concerned when the warranty of one year is over. And so I, I'm assuming that is a travel trailer that is made out in Elkhart. I don't recognize the um, designation and it doesn't have a name like Vista or Sunstar or something like that. Um, and, and it kind of depends on what the uh, slide room mechanism is. There are several of them out there that uh, the people use. Schwing Tech is kind of a, a common one that's used in a lot of the uh, travel trailers. There's the Rack and Pinion series underneath. There's uh, a cable slide. So the first thing I always look at um, when we talk about slide rooms, and I've researched this a lot. I went through Lippert's uh, complete certification program. And the number one issue with slide rooms is that you need to level the coach and you need to stabilize it um, that's, that's a little harder to do with a travel trailer, but the thing is, is, you know, you have, you have an unlit, unlevel surface, your frame is going to twist, your floor is going to twist, your sidewall is going to twist, and then you've got resistance. And those motors are not designed to do any type of weight or resistance. Uh, they, they sit on rollers, um, and the rack and pinion, and they sit on rollers and they're just moving the room and out in and out. They, and especially a swing tech on the side. They want no weight on those, no resistance whatsoever. Otherwise, they won't, they won't work. Um, so make sure that that is first of all. And the second thing that's a gremlin is your batteries. Now, if you have a travel trailer, you probably have one group 24 up in the tongue of that unit. And I would imagine since it's a 2108, it's probably a 21 foot smaller trailer. So that would be a smaller uh, unit up there. And even though it's a 2022, those batteries can get sulfated in a hurry. So the first thing I tell people is if you have a slide situation that is running intermittent or not running at all, the very first thing I do is plug it into shoreline power or put some kind of a battery charger on it. In your case, you could start the tow vehicle with it plugged in because your seven pin is going to give you charge back to those batteries and make sure those batteries are, are, are completely charged and good. Now, I've had a lot of people say, well, I know the battery's good because there's 12.6. Well, you know, if they're sulfated, they, they can show 12.6, but the minute you try to put a load on them, they just, nothing. And so you take it into the dealership, and of course the dealership, then they plug it into their 30 amp service and that converter charges 13.2 or 13.6 if the batteries are down and it runs the slide room in and out, perfect. And it's sitting on a nice level floor in the service bay. Everything seems to work. You go back out and guess what? You know, so put uh, put a charge on that and and then see if they if they run in and out. And you did say intermittent. Um, works sometimes, but but not others. And and that that really rings batteries uh, when I see that because. Uh, you know, so what I would do is if your dealer can't find the problem, it's probably because they're, they're plugging that in. You know, um, if you ever had a, a car with kind of a weak battery or the alternator wasn't working and you went out and you went to start it and went rrr, 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 and then went brrr. that's what these do. You know, you've got you've got kind of a top off power as they sit for a while. You put a even put a meter on them. And it's twelve point six. And you think, yeah, these are charged up. And then the minute you try to try to put some resistance or a load on that thing, boom, they just 
dropout. So those are the things that, that I would look at. And, and uh, you know, the, the, the thing you really have to do when you have a gremlin problem like these with anything is whenever it happens out in the field, out in your campground, wherever you happen to be at, write down everything you can think about what's happening at that time. You know, what's the temperature outside? Uh, you know, do, do, are you plugged in? Are you not plugged in? Do you have weight inside that? You know, I, I've seen some slide room where, where people came in and they were going to go on a long trip. So they put a ton of stuff in the outside compartment and then they put a ton of stuff on the inside compartment uh, um, of that coach and everything in there. And then it didn't work. You know, so those are the things that, that I would look at. If it's a swing tech, uh, there's a few more things you can you can look at with with that. But um, you know, if the motor on that's going to be hydraulic or electric, and you should be able to find out if it doesn't work, you should be able to take a multimeter and go and say, do I have 12 volts going to that motor? Swing tech will be up in the walls, right uh, in the opening area. You can pull the flap back and literally see them. If it's hydraulic, uh, it'll be underneath. Uh, in a compartment, if it is the cable slide, it'll be above the bed, um, up in the top. And so verify if the motor's working or not, you know, if, if it's electric, especially, do you hear the motor working? You know, chances are it's not. So uh, Tommy Turner said, any idea how to reach the black tank valve on a 2018 Vista? The ham handle seems to work fine, but it's clearly not closing the valve all the way. I cannot see the valve itself. Any ideas? Um, I'm not. I'm not exactly familiar with the Vista, but I do know that Winnebago has been putting a lot of the, um, the the tank valves since the tank is over on the other side of the unit, and the uh, the dump valve is in the service center. They're using a cable to go all the way across there, and a lot of times those cables will stretch. And so when you go to push it back in, uh, it, it, it might be flexing a little bit, not going all the way. It could be that the, the handle, something issue with the handle. So uh, the best thing I would recommend is Winnebago has a, a fantastic website with 3D drawings, diagrams. You can see everything in there. If you go to winnebago.com, go over to the owner's uh, section. There's a tab up the top says owners. You click on that, you'll see resources and you go down to resources and it will bring up the um, wiring diagrams. It, it says uh, uh, manuals and then there's one that says 3D uh, drawings, parts and um, wiring diagrams. I would go to the 3D one. I do this a lot when I get questions on Winnebago's and I can tell exactly where it's at. So then all of a sudden you, it, you, you will have to put in your uh, making your model a uh, year and then uh, you will be able to go into a variety of different lists and you want to go into the, the plumbing sewage section of it and it will bring up literally a 3d diagram that you can find where everything is at in that so that's that's what i would do um, to be able to find it what is the best sealant to cover waterproof an entire roof on a 34 Jayco J flight. We are looking at the RV armor sealant. Um, I, I've had a lot of people that have used the RV armor. Um, you know, the, the challenge um, that you have with just about any product out there, you really don't know how well it's going to perform till, uh, you know, seven, eight, nine years down the road. So th there's not a, a lot of track record, but I think a lot of people have been happy with our, uh, the RV armor product. Um, I do know the Dicor does have a longevity of, um, you know, have been in the market for a long, long time. And I think that's, in my opinion, one of the best ones that's out there. So if you clean it up really well, go to the Dicor site and their roof sealant, and it's very easy to install. It, it's very similar to R RV Armor. I'm sure they would argue with that. But, um, you know, I, I would say go look at the forums and just see it. I'm not familiar enough with the, that product. I am with the Dicor. So John says, uh, does the shed work on electrical system? Can you prior prioritize what gets shed first? How does the shed work on? Oh, okay. Okay. I think uh, he's got a Thor Venetian. And when he talks about the shed, 
work on the electrical system. I think, John, you're talking about the energy management system. Uh, Intellitech makes one. Winnebago uses their own um, in the one place. I can't, I can't remember what they call it, uh, but it's a, it's a version. It's a hybrid of an Intellitech system. And, and what it is is when you're parked uh, in a campground and you're on a 30-amp service or you go to your house, you're on a 20-amp service, you only have a limited amount of electricity to run stuff on the inside of your coach. So if you turn the roof air on, that roof air is going to run at a max of about 14 amps, unless you have an older version. Your refrigerator is going to draw six, eight amps. When your battery uh, drops down to 50%, your converter is going to kick in and it's going to do eight to 14 amps. So you go and turn on the microwave. Now all of a sudden you're above 30 amps. And so the energy management system what it does is it will turn things off. And that's what I think you're referring to at shed, the electrical system. So, um, you know, and everyone's a little different. Um, Winnebago, the way they set theirs up, and you can, you can set it up to anything can shed um, in a one, two, three, four pattern. So Winnebago, the way they did it is um, when you hit above 30 amps, then it recognizes that and it turns off the back compressor because that's going to draw some pretty high amps. It still leaves the motor on. So you still have some cooling power, you still have some air movement. And the whole idea is that, you know, usually what happens is that you've got a one or two roof airs running, um, which on a 30 amp service, you, you're really close to that top. You go to turn the microwave on, then all of a sudden, you know, you're over 30 amp, but you're only gonna do it for a couple minutes. So turning the back roof compressor off, roof air compressor off first, then they go to the motor then they go to the refrigerator, which will jump over onto LP normally if you have an absorption refrigerator. Plus, again, it's you know even 30 minutes off, a refrigerator is not going to spoil food. And then it goes into the water heater. Um, so that's how Winnebago does it. Intellitech makes that same version, and every manufacturer kind of decides what do I want to shed first? What's mo more important to keep running? So it could be the back roof air and then the front roof air, you know, so it, it's hard to tell un, un, unless, and you should have inside, you should have a, um, a list, a light that shows you what your amp draw is and where those are at. Now, when you're on 50 amp, it doesn't matter. You have enough to do all that stuff. So that's just usually when you're on 30 amp uh, and be very careful if you plug into 20 amp, like at a home or garage or stuff like that, because, um, you know, you, you can't run much of anything. In fact, you don't want to run a roof air conditioner on a 20 amp because of the spike when it first starts, unless you have a soft start. Um, that's something we installed and you'll, you, you've seen some Facebook posts on that. Soft start keeps that initial amp draw from ramping up into, sometimes it hits 50 amps, which your system can handle for a short amount of time, but then it, it, it won't do it repeatedly. So hopefully if you have a different if originally I thought it says, how does the shed work on electrical system? My shed uh, has 120 out here and I plug in, it's a different shed. All right, um, so Hannah says, crazy question, but do all slides have to be closed to start the engine of a motorhome? And that, it's not a cra cra yeah. crazy question because every manufacturer does it a little different. You know, I, I've been able to, um, with most of the Winnebago product, with the um, the uh, Thor Challenger we have out here that have been working on, they all will start with the slide rooms out, but I do know there are some that will not start with, with the slide room out. We had a uh, coachman, Murata, that was parked in our backyard, um, not our backyard, the next doors, during Ragbri, which is the big bike ride across Iowa, and they had a power issue and they they could not start the unit without the, without the slide rooms in. So everyone is a little different. Uh, you have, you didn't say what kind of a coach it is, um, but most of the time to get the slide rooms to run, you have to have it in the ACC side. Um, the the brake pedal or the park brake on, or have the engine started, and uh, you know, so like I say, that that Murata did not, but uh, and and the park break in, so you know you can't drive off with the um, slide rooms out. Peter 
Chino or Sino, C-I-N-O, what is your recommendation for to prolong battery life when storing the RV during cold winter months? Number one, remove the four house and two coach batteries. Uh, lots of work and time. Or number two, solar trickle charge. Or three, intermittently start the engine. So uh, you've got two different systems that you're talking about. Engine and so you got a motorhome. You've got the engine start batteries. And uh, so what I recommend for the start batteries is to do one of those small little solar trickle charges. Uh, those are, are real handy to put up on the dash, um, unless you've got a cover, on, of course, in there. And, um, you know, I've done, I've done those several times. You can get them at pretty inexpensive at Harbor Freight and some of those places. Um, for the house batteries, then I, you know, the, the solar trickle charge is okay. Um, the only problem is, is you're going to, you're going to get sulfation on those. What happens is, is that they drain down and sulfur attacks the plates of those units. And if you don't have a multi-stage charger or get a bulk charge in those, uh, then you're going to have problems with it. My recommendation would be to take a look at the, uh, battery minder and people get it confused with battery tender, which is just a, a little, um, two amp battery charger. But a battery minder is a product that will send high impact waves into the battery and will break up sulfation. And they have a uh, 120 volt version that will do that because typically your RV is going to have a converter like this WIFCO converter here. And I think we've done this a few times. If I got it on, let's see what we got here. Okay, we can see that it is, it was running. Oh, let me check here. Power, power, power. Yes. So the fan was running. Let's see what we'll get for power here. All right, so we can see here we're at 13.6. And what that's telling us is that the battery is, is, is drained down or is not there. So at, naturally, this one is not there. So, so we're going to unplug this. And a conventional converter like this one or one that you would have in the all-in-one like this, is going to charge that battery at 13.6 until the battery gets up to 12.6, and then it's going to drop to what's called a storage or a maintenance charge, and that's 13.2. That doesn't break up any sulfation. That is going to coat the plates, and it's going to continue to do that. Now, um, if you look at Progressive Dynamics, they have one that goes up to 14.4. It has a boost, then an equalizing, um, and a storage mode, and that will break up sulfation to a point, uh, I did find out last night when we did one of our live that a lot of these batteries want 15.5 and uh, you don't see that in just about anything out there. So uh, the thing with your battery is, you know, probably the, uh, the best thing that it, since you don't have electricity, it looks like to be able to plug in and have the good and, and then probably don't have a multi-stage converter. And the way you can tell is that when your battery gets, gets down a little bit, just every once in a while, go in and check the voltage. If you see it getting up into the 14, 15 volt range, then you know you have that multi-stage charger and uh, it will break up sulfation. But since you don't have electricity, um, you're right, remove the batteries and the coach batteries. Now, the thing that you got to remember about the coach batteries, when you remove those or you let them um, drain down and go dead, you will lose the settings in your engine computer, your uh, ECU, you know, electronic computer unit. And that will then, uh, my folks did this every year. We'd go out, we'd have to jump the batteries, and then we'd have to start the engine. It was on a workhorse with a Chevy. And uh, you know, we'd jump it, we'd start it, and we'd let it go. Uh, you, it would not go into 
um, drive because the RPMs would not get above, I think it was, a, it was under a thousand even. So until you let it run for about 10 minutes, and then it started to reset itself a little bit. And then you would have to drive it at 15 miles an hour for about 25 miles and it would start to reset it. So I had this whole procedure of things and, and every year we had to do this until I went and got one of those little uh, solar panel things just to keep it charged. So in my opinion, the best thing would be to take a look at Battery Minder, go to Northern Tool. They have a solar panel version that will allow you to um, keep those batteries topped off. Um, and, you know, the, the challenge there is do you have, you know, good line of sight to the sun? Are you using a cover? Do you have to put them up on the top and so forth? But uh, that would be my recommendation. Martha says, my husband passed away. I am very sorry to hear that, Martha. And I have never driven our 2016 Leprechaun M23 CB, but I would like to start driving it. But it is intimidating. Are there any RV driving schools in California or anywhere else? Um, I don't know of any uh, driving schools in California. I do know that uh, RV basic um, education, and let me, you know what, I want to, I'm going to do a Google search because I know these guys, I just can't remember. Um, their exact name. Uh, national, uh, so there's the National RV Training Academy, which is down in Texas. Uh, they do hands on stuff. There is, there it is, rvbasictraining.com. And if you go to their website, um, where are they located? I know they're located in the East Coast, but they are actually getting more and more uh, people involved. They got a boot camp. And unfortunately, they used to go to the RV California, uh, the RVIA California show and conduct driving seminars down in the Los Angeles area, but that show's not going on anymore. But um, I would recommend to go to that because they have boot camps, uh, they have whole driving seminars. Um, it doesn't say here where they are located. Um, policies, terms, resources. Gary Lewis is the director of it. And it doesn't say exactly where they're at, but 951 area code. By if if I remember correctly, they were um, out in the east, east coast, but had, had more teams that they were um, setting up. So that, that would be my, my recommendation. The other thing is check with the dealer. A lot of dealers now are starting to, um, you know, get their mechanics into some type of, uh, orientation programs. And, uh, I, I see some of my, no lazy days did a driving thing, which is down in, in, uh, Tampa, Florida, but they also have now other, they got Denver, Colorado and a few other places. So I, I would check with, uh, some of your local dealers as well, but it, it's, you know, a 23 foot class C, the leprechaun, that's what that's on. Um, I'm, pretty sure i'm not sure if it's on the mercedes or on the m might mean mercedes um but that's that's a pretty easy unit uh, and i would suggest you know if you can find somebody that uh is driving and maybe what you do is is talk with some of the dealers and if they don't have anybody that can help you ask them if they have delivery drivers that are bringing the units out from four city at winnebago or elkhart with the other ones and, uh, you know, if, if they would be willing to help give you some pointers at, you know, a big parking lot like a, a church during the weekdays or a junior college on the weekends, they could drive the unit there for you and just give you some pointers. So you got some options. Okay, so Tony Turner said regarding the black water tank valve, I saw the diagram. I see where it is in the diagram. I cannot see it when I get under the vehicle and I can't see what I need to pull apart to get it. So he did go to the, the diagram. Um, what it And it was a Tony, what, remind me what, Winnebago, Winnebago, Vista. Okay, so it's class A on that Vista. Um, you pretty much, from what I remember um, working on several of those, 
you're, you're going to, you see where it's at. You won't see it. I think the only way you, you can get at it is to uh, tear apart some of the um, compartment paneling. If you start opening up those, uh, those underneath compartments and you look and you'll see some black panels that have screws in those, they, they do not make it easy to get at. Um, you, you, I'm pretty sure you won't find it from underneath. You're going to have to start tearing some of that stuff apart. The other thing I would recommend, they've got a really good owner relations department. Those guys know their stuff, um, and I rely on them a lot of times with stuff like this. Um, I had one. Um, it was an adventurer. Um, no, it was Brave, Winnebago Brave. We had two we were working on that I had to take the whole service panel apart to get in and, and get at it. So um, sometimes they're not really easy. Uh, one of the things I have not mentioned yet is our download for tonight is the seven tips to keep you rolling down the road. You see that at the top. You can just go up there and... Uh, and download that, and you'll see the, the seven tips with checklists and stuff like that. Joshua says, hello. Hi, Joshua. First time RV owner. Congratulations. Welcome to the RV world. And just found out about the live stream. Good. I found and fixed the source of the water leak. Is there anything I can do to remove the mold damage from inside the cabin? Um, there, are some, there are some mold bombs that uh, I have seen, not really much for the RV industry, but they're more for uh, residential, that if you go to the home improvement stores, you should be able to, to see some of that stuff. Um, you know, the, the biggest thing is I've always just taken a, a quarter cup of bleach and a gallon of water, you know, make up about a five gallon solution of that stuff, put on some rubber gloves and just scrub everything down really good. You probably are not gonna get it all out. Um, you know, one of the things that you might want to take a look at is uh, go through the search here. And I did not uh, watch every episode, but uh, we did have George renovate a, a 1996, I believe, a Salem that had extensive, extensive water damage all the way from the roof down and completely ruined the floor. And I think he had some product in there that he was he was using because I know he had a lot of mold in that, but I didn't see all the way through it. So take a look at that, uh, that renovation project and see, but you, know, you should be able to go down to a home improvement store and just talk to them, so ask them about the, uh, the mold bomb uh, that, that is available. Terry asks, is it okay to run the refrigerator on propane while in the towing operation? And I, I typically don't, I don't recommend to do this. Um, the reason is, is that if you're running it on propane, I know everybody says, well, how do I keep it cold? I don't have 120 volt power and so forth. And, you know, but, and you'll also find thousands of people said, I've been doing it for years and I never had a problem. And, and that's, you know, that happens with anything, but you know, one time, I don't want to be the one. Um, so what happens is when you're running down the road with your propane tank open and the lines are going to the refrigerator, you've got these really thin soft copper lines that are supplying LP to the stove, to the refrigerator, to the water heater. And all these are right on the sidewall. You know, you, you take a look at, the, you know, open a compartment sometime underneath the sink and underneath the refrigerator. Um, even if you take the refrigerator bent off the back, there's all these lines sitting right there. So if you sideswipe a sign, if you have any kind of a side, you know, little bender, thing or accident, you now have an open propane line that will put propane in and you've got a flame that's trying to spark on that refrigerator. Um, you can also have valves that loosen up. You know, you've got all these copper connections. And, and so I just, I've, I've always been an advocate of shutting the propane off at the tank uh, since you, and you didn't say, you said towing operations. So you would have the, uh, we call them uh, the DOT cylinders on the front of your your toe uh, of your tongue of your of your trailer and we did several tests there's one on the on site here where if you shut your refrigerator put a five pound bag of ice in the freezer section of that and you leave the door shut that will maintain below 40 degrees for over six hours so uh, you know it, it's your own trade there's there's no laws anymore that i am aware of uh, there are some bridges, there are some tunnels and things that you can't have the propane on. I've gotten stuck in those before. But since we have so many buses now and other uh, vehicles that are using uh, either natural gas or propane 
as an alternative source. You know, I don't know of any states that have outlawed it, but in my opinion, it's just, it's, it's safer to just shut that off and, and go. D says, how important is it to get the small air bubbles out of Eternabon tape? And, uh, you know, I, I have used Eternabon. In fact, I got, I'm going to go off camera for a second because it's really messy over here and you don't want to see this. This stuff is phenomenal. So you will see, and if I simply put this down on here, if I leave that set overnight, I come back tomorrow, well, so, um, you know, I've used this a lot of times um, on motorhomes, travel trailers. Oh, it was upside down. And it's great stuff. It is just unbelievable how sticky this stuff is. You pull this back here. So if you get some air bubbles in it, and I have, um, you know, you're not going to get everything out. What's this? Let's see it. I have my, my camera lady says, what? The sticker. Oh, okay. The sticker. So but anyway, she keeps me on track. Um, you know, the thing is, is that stuff is so tough. It's not like decals and everything. So, I, you know, I, I have put it on roof to sidewall joints, front caps, and, you know, I've gotten several minor air bubbles. You know, I, tr I try to generally use a, a squeegee, um, what do they call those, plastic uh, buddy potty, buddy, body putty, buddy potty. Dyslexia is a thing terrible, um, you know, to, to kind of help get that out but i don't i wouldn't be too worried about the air bubbles in there because that's some very strong stuff and it's not like they're gonna burst and let any moisture in so i would i wouldn't be worried about it martha says thank you i will continue the search it's a ford okay so it's a ford probably an f450 martha was the one asking about the uh leprechaun and driving lessons and uh you know but i'm pretty sure 23 feet so you don't have a lot of overhang on the back of that. You don't have a lot of swing um, or, or cutting like you would some of the bigger units. So it's going to be a lot easier, I think, for you to get accustomed to that. Uh, and and uh, about the only thing that I, I say with people on a, on a Class C like you have there that I don't know if it has the bunk over the top, but sometimes that gets a little uh, overwhelming because it feels like you're in a cave. So that's why I say go out to a you know, a parking lot and just bring some cones. Um, you know, I've done a few driving schools. I, I actually helped develop the driving school for uh, RV Safety Education Foundation that's being done for na nationwide out in the, in the country. And I've done many schools, physical schools out driving. And we used to use clay pigeons, the, the trap shooting little things. And they got a really bright fluorescent cover to them so you can see them real well. And then when you run over them, they pop, and that's the fun part. Uh, but I would say go get some cones and just practice driving. You know, where does it cut when you make that right-hand turn? That's going to be your biggest issue normally is the right-hand turn. And one of the things that I highly recommend that you keep in mind when, when you're, you know, when you start to drive and you get out and, you in, in, um, you know, looking at, at taking that venture, put a little note on your dash that says, pull forward or drive through. And uh, I, I still do a driving seminar at the shows when, when the shows pick up here again. And one of the things I tell people all the time is just keep in mind when you pull in anywhere that you're going to stop somewhere or any place you're going to think about driving through, you know, so I come into a fueling station and I see where, oh, man, this one right here, it sure looks good. It's right there. I can come in, but if I pull in there, and somebody pulls up in front of me to go in and get some coffee or something, am I stuck? Do I have to back out? You know, if I'm at a parking lot and a convenience store or a big box store like Walmart, you know, sure, you want to get closer to the front, but you know what? Then all of a sudden you get pinned in and you have to back out. Don't do that. You know, keep in mind, I want to find out where's that easy place um, that I can just get in and drive forward to get out of here. I don't want to have to back up and all that stuff. And you would be amazed at how many people will help you at a campground. 
If you pull into the campground and you don't feel comfortable, talk to the host. There's a lot of people that will actually drive it in for you or help spot you. So uh, there's a lot of friendly people at the campgrounds. They'll help you out. Uh, <clears throat> I can't see what part. Okay. It was Tim. Terry asks, is it okay to run a refrigerator on propane? I just did that. And I hope that's not Terry, my Thor guy. If it is, hi, Terry. I'm working on it. Uh, Martha, it's a four. Okay, I scrolled down. So Jerry says, I've been busy with school and previously with COVID issue. I have not used my 2018 Nexus Ghost Super C coming up for two years, and that's pretty common. What should I have done or what should I do now to make sure it's still in good shape? It's sitting in my mechanic's parking lot, unplugged. Well, if it's unplugged, your batteries are probably, uh, well, I know they're dead and they might be shot um, at this point. They might be past being able to be rejuvenated. Uh, I would say also that you probably, if it's a Super C, I'm assuming you have diesel fuel in it. Um, you could have condensation that's formed in that if it's not completely filled. And if you didn't put in a, uh, a diesel additive um, into it, diesel fuel also uh, gets bacteria, kind of mold-like stuff, I think. Uh, I don't know exactly what it is, but it, it, it does become contaminated. So, um, you know, what I would recommend is to pull those batteries out if it's not plugged in. Uh, I'm sure your engine battery is dead as well because the computer draws, your, even your radio presets draw from the engine battery. So that's probably dead. So I would bring those into a garage somewhere and, um, you know, just, just put a charger on them um, and, and try to bring them back up. See if you can bring them back up. I would, I would have uh, draw some of the diesel fuel out and get it. I think you can get it tested to just see the, you know, the level of deterioration that is, is in that. Um, the other thing I would highly recommend is that that unit has sat and dried out. So your roof to sidewall, your front caps, all your sealants um, on the roof, the roof material. And I don't know if Nexus uses fiberglass or if they use uh, a rubber membrane, but you know, all that's drying out and it's all going to start to crack and pull apart and deteriorate. And so you definitely, I would say, um, get somebody out there to clean the roof and condition it. Yeah, um, if, it, if it's fiberglass, you don't have a lot of conditioning to do. But if it's a rubber membrane, you definitely want to clean that thing and it will start to uh, deteriorate in the pores and things. And you don't want leaks. So all that sealant, front to back, side walls, you've got lap sealant that is uh, typically a, um, a uh, self-leveling lap seal. But that all, all dries out when it's just sitting exposed to the sun. If you're not going to use it for a lot longer still, I would probably recommend go getting a cover for it. Uh, ADCO, A-D-C-O, makes a very good cover. They're customized, and uh, uh, they're not that expensive. They're, they're pretty reasonably priced. D. Moore says, my husband and I bought a 2015 Thor Murata, uh, no, Miramar, uh, a couple years ago. We moved to Corpus Christi, Texas a year ago, and then to the country. Our stabilizers now will not extend. My thoughts are the salt in the air has caused issues. Uh, what could it be? So um, Thor Miramar, I believe when you call it stabilizers, um, I'm not sure what they use. You know, right now we've Power Gear was a system that was out in the market, which was hydraulic. They were purchased by Lippert. We have Quickie had some out at one point. Atwood had some out at another point. HWH, um, you know, first of all, I, I would, you know, I, I'd need to know what type of leveling jacks you have. You call them stabilizers. So there, there's also a difference, leveling jacks versus stabilizers. Um, a Thor Miramar, I'm assuming, is a Class A, if I remember correctly. There's been so many back and forth names and things that, that go in. But um, if you're saying stabilizers and, and you're meaning leveling jacks that will level and stabilize, uh, then they're hydraulic more, more than likely. Uh, you didn't say what size. There are some electric ones out there. But, uh, you know, the first thing I would look at is power to the motor. 
uh, to make sure you get 12 volt power that's coming to that hydraulic motor. Uh, does it does it work? So if you do have 12 volt power, then when you hit the switch for uh, to extend the jacks, does the motor try to start? Um, if it does, then you look at the hydraulic fluid. That is, you know, make sure that's in there. And the next thing then is that uh, if if you've got power to the motor, it seems to want to start, but it's just it's not getting through. And it could be um, the jacks themselves are corroded, but normally, uh, usually it isn't salt in the air. Um, you know, it's just, it's just, a not cleaning them. HWH recommends to spray them with WD-40 and wipe them off. Most of the other ones don't say WD-40, uh, because it takes, it, it literally will take the lubricating oil that's off there and, and will eat at the rubber seal. Uh, CRC is a, is a really good product. They're, they're silicone because it flashes off or dries. You know, just so spray them really, really good and then just wipe that cylinder off and then look at that um, jack inside and, you know, so take those steps. But you got to verify you got power going to it, that it's trying, and, and then you can look at the jacks. Warren Taylor says, other than a bag of ice, what can I put uh, in my tanks to solve erratic tank sensor readings? Uh, and, and, you know, the bag of ice is kind of one of those... Um, I call it campground fiction. Some people say it works. Some people say it doesn't. But what happens is, is you have a uh, holding tank. Let me grab this. And this is one I just mocked up. And so you got power coming in to this probe right here on this side. So the power comes in here and then it's, um, it's gonna go off to your monitor panel to tell you what the reading is through one of these probes. So as the water level rises, it arcs across here and then it arcs across here and then it arcs across here. So it's gonna say it's a third, it's two thirds, it's full. You dump that tank and then what's happening is you still have some calcium, some rust, some lime, uh, foam, um, toilet paper. You know, there's all kinds of stuff that can stick to the side of this, this box or the holding tank and it will create a false reading. So the idea of the, the ice is that the ice is going to knock all those, we call them Klingons, <laughs> on those. So you put the ice in there and you drive around, you got to dump it down your toilet and you drive around with that in there and it's supposed to slosh and break all that stuff up. And, you know, does it work? Sometimes, um, you know, to me, probably the best thing out there is Tank Blaster. Now, this is a product from Thetford and you literally... You know, Put in a, a bag of this. There's more that comes in. I've used several of these in here. And the instructions on this say so one packet cleans up to a 50 gallons holding tank. And you pour it into the holding tank through the toilet, completely fill the holding tank with fresh water, and let the solution sit overnight and then flush the tanks. I, I also recommend to drive around, you know, for 15, 20 minutes and just let that stuff, you know, get dissolved in there. Um, sometimes it takes a couple of those to do it, but I have had uh, four or five people here just within the last year that I have put those into and uh, it has worked very, very well. Uh, yeah, you, yeah, you have to do it, you know, periodically because you're going to keep running sewage through there. And so that's, in my opinion, the best way to clean it. Timothy Dolan said, should the engine alternator charge the house batteries for six volt batteries while driving the 2019 Georgetown 36 D7? And typically it will. And again, I've learned never to say never or always say always, I guess is another one. But your, your engine battery, since you've got a... Um, 
you set a Georgetown 36D and it's got four six volt batteries sitting in banks. So your, your six volt batteries are hooked positive to negative on one bank that gives you a 12 volt and positive to negative on a second bank that gives you a 12 volt. And then it's hooked positive to positive, negative to negative so that you have two 12 volt banks and you're doubling your, your amp hours. So as you drive down the road, you have what's called a battery uh, isolation management solenoid, BIM solenoid. And when you're driving down the road, your alternator is going to run at 14 amps approximately charging your batteries. And that goes back through that solenoid and should charge your engine battery or your house batteries while you're driving um, down the road. And then also that BIM acts as a jump start. So you should somewhere in your, in your Georgetown have a um, momentary switch that will, so let's say your engine batteries are dead because you left the radio on or whatever happened. And you've got these house batteries sitting back there. Man, it'd be nice to jump those. So you push this spring loaded button and it opens that line back up and will jump start your engine batteries. How you can tell is if, if you have one is just take a multimeter like this, put it onto the 12 volt setting DC. We already got that on here now and then put it on your battery. Nothing started on it yet, but you should have about 12.6 volts on your battery. Go start your engine. And then if you see this rise up into 13, 14 volt range, then you know that's what's charging your battery from the backside. But typically it, it will do that. Where are we at? We got about seven minutes left. Do older RV furnaces, do old RV furnace recalls expire? I was told mine has one, 1985 Ford Motorhome. Um, you know, typically recalls do not expire. Um, that, you know, I, I'm not familiar with the furnace recall. I know that the, um, the Norcold and the Dometic refrigerator recalls did not expire. Um, what you need to do is get your serial number, the model and serial number uh, of your your furnace, it's probably either a Suburban or um, uh, could be a Hydroflame or an Atwood and get your serial number off of that. There should be a phone number to call the um, that company on their customer service and they should be able to look it up for you. You know, it, it might be a 1985, um, you know, it might be a situation of it has a recall, but the recall part is no longer available. I, and I have, I have seen situations like that, not on a recall as much as something, you know, that needed to be serviced or, or worked on. So I, I would call the company, but you got to have your serial number and your model number. Otherwise you won't get anywhere. So Mary Jean says suggestions for valve extenders. And, um, you know, there's several of them out there. Wheelmaster made some for a while, um, that were very good. Dexter, uh, made some, um, trying to think who else had them. The thing I recommend with valve extensions and what, you, what you're, I'm sure what you're trying to do is you've got inside duels on those back that you want to be able to fill and to read. And, uh, you want to make sure you get a, a quality extender that has, um, that has a, uh, uh, non air loss type of a stem. And what that means is that if, if your simulator, which is the, the shiny metal piece in there, if it, it's going to shift while you're driving, the heat sh exchanges and so forth, that can cut into that valve extension coming through that wheel from on the outside wheel. And in the past, that was just a, it was an automatic flat tire if you put it on. Winnebago didn't put extensions on for years and years just because it was automatic flat tire. They came out with a system now where the the valve stem that goes down, if it, if it cuts off, it doesn't lose any air because in that stem, you know, when you push the valve to put air in it, that stem has a little rod, flexible rod that goes down and pushes the valve, which is the actual valve that seals it is still on the tire or, or the rim. And so you won't lose any air pressure by doing that. So make sure, I, I'm pretty sure it was Wheelmaster and a couple others. So Jerry says rvsafety.com is another training site for the lady that wants to learn more about her, their RV. People like Gary Bunzer, the RV doctor used to teach there. 
Gary, uh, yeah, and I, I'm wondering who Jerry is because I helped develop that program uh, for them, RV Safety Education. Gary Bunzer unfortunately passed away of COVID uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, Walter and Amy Cannon used to teach it. Walter has retired and he's working on his beach home. Uh, I've talked to him recently. Trey Seelman is the executive director of that now. If you go to rvsafety.com, like Jerry did post in here, um, you can see they don't do a lot of driving safety programs. Uh, they, they, I take that back. They have a driving safety program. I helped develop their nine topic book that was fire and propane and sa driving safety and towing and so forth. So they, they do have a, a driving safety program that is, uh, you know, manuals, online training like that. The only time they, they do uh, the hands-on stuff is when they have their, um, their uh, workshop. And it's, it's in here, Trey Seal, a gentleman by the name of Trey Seelman is one of the major players. He is the executive director um, at RV Foundation's workshop. And I'm not, I'm not familiar with that, but uh, they just had a seminar on September 8th through the 11th. Uh, the seminar they had the 8th through 11th, they held at the um, Hershey RV show. Um, so I don't know. They don't get out to the, the West Coast that often. He'll probably be, I'm, I'm sure he's at the open house this week. They go to the FMCA rallies. They go to some of the bigger, um, you know, club rallies. Also, they go to the um, Tampa Super Show. But I, I would, and go to their site. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful site. I've worked with them for 30 years now. In fact, they were called Way We Go before they were RV Safety Education Foundation. And, and I spent a lot of time, you forgot to mention John Anderson. John is the one that started the RV uh, Safety Education Foundation uh, and had Way We Go. So Steve Correa, is it a good idea to, where are we at? We got about a minute left, so I'm going to we only and we got one question. Is it a good idea to get a higher pressure water pump on a class A to increase shower pressure? I don't like the low flow. Um, it, it depends on your pump, your piping. Um, since you, you didn't put what make or model or year it is in, you know, the thing you have to be careful is that that uh, if it has PEX pipe, PEX can handle up to 60, 70 psi. Uh, but you also then have to look at what fittings you have, you know, what elbows and connectors and how's it clamped or is it compression fitting? Is it flare it system? So forth. So you can get higher pressure. Um, you know, the, the average water pump, uh, and, and I guess the way you could tell before you went and bought a system like that is to hook it to a city water fill and, and just see what kind of pressure you have at your city water fill. Some of the campgrounds will go up into the 60 PSI range and, you know, it's kind of old fashioned, does it leak? Um, you know, what a lot of manufacturers do before they ship it is they will run air at 60 PSI and they'll, they'll fill the system and then cap it. And then they'll watch to see if it loses that, you know, that pressure, you know, with a closed system and that'll tell if it leaks or not. So you could do it with an air compressor as well dial it down to 60 PSI, but SureFlow makes a variety of different units that they're called Pentair now. Uh, I did see that uh, there is a, um, I think Lippert even has um, a uh, water pump now. Some of those will go up into the 50 PSI range. I have seen those. So that is something that you, you could up, but I would look at what you have right now and just make sure you don't have a higher pressure one and that something else is causing it. Could be a the screen, you know, is is restricting your your flow going through. So we hit five o'clock. We are out of questions. Um, Al Jewel says, "Go back to Al Jewel question." Okay, let's do that. Did I miss that? Hi, Thor 2020 27 FE. You say be level to open the slide in the driveway. The rear is six inches low. The slide works okay. Should I be more careful? I would. Uh, you know, anytime you have any kind of uh, a situation where that unit isn't level and secure, then you're going to cause resistance in that in that slide room. And you know, I worked at Winnebago Industries for 15 years, and we spent about seven or eight years designing, testing, re-engineering, retesting slide mechanisms and about everything that was out there. And and you know, the hardest thing on those things is when you don't have it uh, secure and level 
so that you know that room needs to glide out on those rollers that it can't have you know crooked sidewall means that all of a sudden now you're you're pushing like a bad drawer in a dresser so I, I would I would highly recommend that that you get that as level as possible and secure so I think sorry about it. sorry I don't know why I missed that did you miss the question for Chuck one more sorry Katie we're going to Chuck I did. How did I miss those two in there? Alternate, because I skipped across. I'll get Chuck's here. I have a 1995 Country Coach Magna. I bought about three years ago. My cruise control has stopped working. The fuse is good, but not having knowledge of the system, I'm in a quandary. I, I, I got to tell you, I am not familiar enough with the Country Coach. They were built out in Oregon. Winnebago bought them um, and tried to, you know, resurrect that company, and it was too far gone um, kind of at, at that time. And they were very proprietary. They built a lot of their own stuff. They built their own, uh, you know, they used some chassis, but it was it was pretty much a custom built uh, type of a program. Now, uh, I do know there is, um, and was, I, I guess, you know, with the pandemic, I'm not sure, but there was a service center still out in Oregon, I believe it was, that actually was factory service center at one point and then when they went out of business they kind of formed their own stuff and i know a guy that owns the monaco dynasty that has uh taken his unit up to those guys because coach uh, um country coach didn't own them but it had a lot of similarities and he said they were outstanding so i i would recommend to give them a call um otherwise i man i, I just don't know uh, Dana usually is the company that most people use for the cruise controls um, if they're not chassis supplied. So uh, I guess you just, there are some good forums on those country coaches out there too. They were great coaches, but pretty proprietary. So sorry I missed your, your question there. Thanks for re-upping that in. Um, so, yep. All right. Well, with that, I appreciate everybody coming out. And uh, we'll see you next month. Uh, starting to get cold here. So uh, we're going to start seeing some people head south. Thanks again and appreciate it.